I'm about to give you a comprehensive free tutorial on the features and operation of the Denon DJ Prime 4 standalone DJ console, focusing mainly on the hardware functions. It's an advanced DJ system, especially suited to event DJs, but equally to performance DJs, because despite the fact that it functions without a laptop, it has most of the features laptop DJs have got used to. Things like beat gridding, track analysis, key sync, and four standalone decks. It's got a gorgeous touch screen, it's got great mixed channels, it's got innovative output options, including a separate zone output, and integrated streaming from major providers over Wi-Fi and Ethernet. It's even compatible with Serato DJ Pro if you just want to use it as a controller. Now, if you're coming from another Denon DJ model or another hardware brand or another type of DJ system, check out our table of contents. You can hit Control F or Command F, depending on your computer, type in the keyword, and if we've got a chapter marker for it, it'll be highlighted. Hit the time code and the video will jump to that specific part. Now, this is designed to be a video manual, so do feel free to come back and reference it as often as you like. But for those of you who are pure beginners or even intermediate DJs, a word of warning. The video here is not going to be enough for you to play great DJ sets with your Prime 4. There are many skill sets and pieces of knowledge that you have to be able to combine to crush it as a DJ. So I can teach you about this piece of gear, but if you don't understand the rest of the gear you'll need or how to find and organize your music or the basics of counting and timing and beat mixing, or the skills of programming music or performing a DJ set or how to get gigs so you can play in front of people in the first place, things of that nature, you're going to be frustrated. When I got started back in 1992, we didn't have YouTube. We had to learn by trial and error. I learned on cheap turntables and a crappy Gemini mixer and it took me years of frustration before I got good. I remember nearly giving up several times, but I didn't. I stuck with it and DJing became my career and has brought me decades of joy. And so I make you that promise. Yes, if you're new to this, you're going to run into some frustrations, but my job is to get you through them. The teaching style that we use at Digital DJ Tips is to focus on the end result, on actually getting you quickly to being able to play in front of other people. That's where the magic happens. That's where the real learning happens. It's not in your bedroom. It's not in your home studio. It's in front of other people. Too many people who want to be DJs spend months or even years locked away behind closed doors, practicing all the wrong stuff, when they could have learned more in just a few hours at a real gig than all those frustrating home sessions added up. Today's DJ gear makes playing gigs, even as a beginner, perfectly possible if you learn the right things early on. Now that said, we have a crash course for beginners called the Complete DJ Course, where I teach you all you need to know to play regular gigs fast. And even better, it works not only for the Prime 4, but for all DJ gear. Once you follow the course, you'll not only be a great DJ, but you'll be able to play confidently in public on any system. Now it's about an 80 lesson course, it keeps growing, uh, and you get access to me personally as your tutor. There are lots of other benefits to help you learn. It's a phenomenal investment in your DJing. I'll put a link to the course in the description underneath so you can check out the info page about that. Now, another great resource is our Amazon best-selling book on how to DJ, Rock the Dance Floor, which is a fantastic primer on the five big areas of DJing, gear, music, techniques, playing out, and promoting yourself. This book has helped tens of thousands of DJs to get started. Again, there's a link in the description. You can get an audio book and Kindle and all that, but I also tell you how you can get a free copy of this book later on. Now we've got a tremendous amount of information to cover, so let's get started. So we'll start by looking at setting the unit up, which isn't very hard. Then we'll move on to looking at the features, a really comprehensive tour of all the features on here. And then we'll move on to operating it, how to actually use this thing. Now, as with any equipment that's like this, it really is a good idea to go to the website, get yourself an account and register so you can download the very latest version of the software because of course this is used in conjunction with Engine Prime software, which we're not covering in this tutorial, but it's the software that you have on your Mac or your PC that you use to gather your music together analyze that music and then output it onto an SD card or a USB drive that you then plug into this, which is what means it's possible to DJ with this away from your laptop entirely. 
while with this unit that isn't necessary because it's so powerful it can actually handle your music if you just throw a load of mp3s at it look you're going to want the software to use this thing properly so therefore it's a good idea to make sure you've got the latest software and at the same time make sure you've got the latest firmware now firmware is what is put inside this thing to make it work in the way that they want it to work today so as the software gets updated you want to be updating your firmware as well and you can check on the site once you register whether there's any new firmware for you it's really really simple to update your firmware you just download it to the computer double click on the file and it will say this is what to do plug your computer into the unit using a normal usb cable and follow the instructions on the screen you have to boot this computer up in a special firmware ready format but again the instructions are on the screen you'd probably do it twice a year maybe but it is worth doing that so I'm going to assume for this tutorial that you've gone through that process and you've got the right firmware on here and you've got the latest version of your software so before you're ready to DJ you want to plug in any inputs and outputs that you want to use to start with let's lift the screen up and I can show you this while we're doing it this lets us firstly see better but also it gives us a chance to show off the little clip there that keeps that really nice and sturdy let's talk through from the left then first there's a Kensington lock so that you can lock this unit down so it can't be taken away the power button there when you turn that on or off it will power the unit up or down correctly but even if you pull the power cable out the unit will still power down properly because it's got a system built in that will turn off your drives and USBs and so on correctly so that's worth knowing the two USBs there work in the same way as the two on the top of the unit. You can plug media in there. However, one of them also charges your phone, which is nice. So just plug in to charge up any phone or tablet you happen to have with you that needs charging in the one that's marked as the charging USB. The link Ethernet connector, which is basically what it is, is a way of connecting this unit to a computer in order to control lighting and other useful things like that. However, the USB that's next to the two USB sockets for media is for connecting to a computer in order to use MIDI over the computer. And so when you're using Serato with this unit, for instance, that's the one that you will use. So moving along to the three big chunky pairs of XLR outputs, there are zone, booth, and master outputs. And the orange plugs are in the RCA on balance, which is another version of the master out and it's the one I'm using to get the music into the room here. Then we move on to the four RCA line ins and you'll see the two of them line phono switch which is where you switch between a record deck and a line input such as a CD player. And then finally as we move along to the far right we've got the two microphone inputs there that can take a quarter inch or an XLR dynamic mic they're not phantom powered so you do need to use a mic that doesn't need its own power. And the little, the little screw thing to the right of the RCAs is where you attach the earth lead from say a Technics turntable that has an, a separate earth lead. So buzzing turntables are normally because the earth lead hasn't been attached. Most turntables don't have that nowadays, but that's where it is if you do have a turntable that still has one of those. So there's an awful lot of knobs and buttons and dials and faders and sliders and all that stuff on here, but really, once you understand what it all is, it ceases to be scary and becomes very useful indeed. So for the next uh, large chunk of this video manual, I'm gonna talk you through the features. So we're gonna start off by looking at the mixer, then we're gonna look at the decks, and then we're gonna look at these areas to the left and right of the place we're gonna start, which is the screen. The screen in the middle of the unit is a fantastic iPhone, iPad style, glass screen is smooth scrolling very fast updating it's a really really nice screen and it's full color full multi-touch and it shows you information that is relevant to whatever you're doing at the moment on the unit. the browse knob in the middle here is the way we select the tunes or the menu items here so pressing the browse knob as you saw me do then will move us forward Pressing the back button here will move us back, so I'm now back on the tunes menu. Forward can also be done by pressing this forward button. And now I'm in the list of tunes that I want to potentially play. So now I'm navigating through the list by turning this knob. If I want to load one of these tracks onto a deck, I can either click 
and it will say load to deck one or two and I can touch the deck that I want it to load to and it will load or I can hit load one or two here and it will load it onto the left or the right hand deck here. So there's two ways of loading the music. Pressing the view button here will cycle between library mode when we're looking predominantly at our tracks and this mode where we've got our waveforms on display and we've also got our tracks up the middle so we don't lose those. We have big waveforms at the top here showing us the whole track and we have waveforms down here at the bottom showing us where we are currently close up in the tracks that we're playing. So pressing view will switch between those two menus. Now if we press and hold the view button then it shows this menu here and this menu here includes the source selection so we can choose whether we're going to be playing from our currently selected source or any other media sources we might have plugged in and we can also move across and look at Wi-Fi networks here so we can get onto our streaming services we'll be talking more about this a little bit later on so that's by holding down there we can also record our sets and sets are recorded to any media that you have plugged in so you can record directly to the same USB or SSD drive that you have your music on or you can have a separate one on and you get to choose that when you hit record and then we have these two menus here utility and preferences so utility and preferences menu we're going to look a lot more at these a little bit later on but we can have a tiny peep now this is where we get to change all kinds of weird and wonderful things about the software to get it working exactly how we want to as I say we'll be talking about this a little bit later on so if we hold down the shift button and then press view then what it's going to do is switch the waveforms when we're in this mode here so shift and view now the waveforms are horizontal. Some people prefer to DJ with their waveforms horizontal and some people prefer to have them like this. It depends upon you, but you do get those two choices. So the channel effects buttons here as we move slowly down. These channel effects buttons decide whether this channel or this one or this one or this one sends its signal to this effects unit here or to this effects unit here. The effects units are where we can add LFO effects which cycle as opposed to sweep effects which we get to control using a knob we'll talk about all this later on but the point here is that you have two of them you can set a different effect on each and you can decide which channel goes to which one by default when you turn it on the left hand two channels for the left hand two decks go to the left hand one and the right hand two channels go to the right hand one but I can change that just as easily if I have a single effect I want to use all the time and I'm not bothered about this one for instance I can set them all to this one here and that's the effect that will be used when it's switched on for that channel so these knobs here called level are sometimes called gain or sometimes called trim and this is the knob that you'll use to adjust the level of the track and you can see if I turn that down the level disappears entirely here I turn this up and get to the point where it's distorting into the into the blue we don't want that there uh, we want it peaking just nicely into the white on this color scheme that they've used here this is pre EQ so this is before the EQ and it's before this so if I turn this fader down for this channel this level is still going to show here so think of these levels as input levels if you are playing a track on this deck and this deck and this deck and something coming in from the back and something from a record and so on then sometimes the input levels are not going to be right so using these level controls here it's kind of like a pre everything volume control and you can set that so it's just about right before you then use the creative controls in your mix basically make sure all the inputs are at roughly the same volume and that's what the gain or in this case they're called the level controls are for Moving on down, starting some music playing again, I'll show you the EQs, low, mid and high EQs here. They're turning the three frequency ranges all the way down or you can boost them. Probably not a good idea to boost them all because it's no different to turning the volume up. So generally we like to keep these around these mid areas here. They can be useful for, again, if the track is a bit muffled or the track's a bit bright, we can kind of tweak the EQ here to make it sound good in the mix, but they're also 
good for creative uses in DJing. For instance, one of the big things DJs like to do is turn down the bass on one of the tracks when they're mixing two tracks so that you don't get two kick drums punching away at once, which is sometimes a bit too much. So the EQs are there for you to tweak, kind of shape the sound. Now the sweep effects, and we have one for each channel, are used to shape the sound a lot more. We'll be talking a, more, a bit more about those and I'll demonstrate them to you when we get to the sweep effects buttons, which are down here in a second. So the channel cue buttons here, these decide which channel or channels you can hear in your headphones. So even with the volume down here and that track playing, I'll hold this against my mic. You can hear that's coming out of the headphones microphone, but it's not coming out of the main microphone until I turn it up like this. But I can turn that off and now it's not in the headphones at all. So this is a way of listening to what's going on on other channels while something else is playing to the audience. Clearly a very important part of DJing is preparing your tracks that way. And that's the way we do it, by pressing the Q buttons here. By the way, the reason they're different colours is that the decks are different colours. We'll move on to the deck controls in a minute. The two blue decks here are these two here. So it's very easy to know which deck is which. As I say, we'll move on to the way the decks work because there's four decks on this controller, but only two physical decks in a little while. Now you've already seen these faders, they're called line faders because I've been bringing this track into and out of the mix here using this one. But we have another fader which can take our tracks in and out of the mix which is the cross fader here. And the cross fader will go between whatever is set here. So these are both set to left. So that means that these decks here will be on when the cross fader is on the left. These are both set to right which means that these decks here will be on when the cross fader is on the right and this is cross fadering between them. That's the deck on the left hand side here and that's the deck on the right hand side here. So the cross fader is another way of moving between the decks that involves not having to manipulate two faders at once. You can do two decks or indeed four decks with just one fader using this fader here, the horizontal cross fader. So these LEDs here are the master mix. Let's get this track here playing again. You can see that we have a nice loud level here, but a very low level here. And the reason for that is the master volume, which we'll get onto later, is turned down low at the moment. Turn that up and it goes up here. I have it low so that it's uh, nice and calm for my microphone so you can hear me on this demo. So these are two different levels. And sometimes it's a good idea to keep an eye on this one as well as these, just because you've got these set right, as soon as you start piling in more inputs, two decks together, using some effects and so on, it can push your master too high. So it's always a good idea to keep an eye on the master level as well as keeping an eye on your input levels. And you've got a very nice big master VU meter up the middle, which lets you do that. So some very nice headphone controls here. I've already showed you how to get the sound into your headphones using the Q buttons, but this area here gives us some extra control. The phones knob here decides whether what we hear in our headphones is only the tracks that we've pressed a Q button for, or whether it's the master only, in which case the Q button won't work at all, they won't do anything because we're only hearing the master output, or a mix between the two and we get to choose. It can be very useful when you are DJing and you haven't got a good speaker near you to be able to mix the two and hear what the crowd are hearing and then hear what you're hearing and then check that they're in time with each other uh, and other stuff that you might want to do by comparing the two using this. So that's what that control does. This is just simply a volume control and split is quite a nice function that is left off, off of a lot of DJ gear nowadays to the chagrin of a lot of old school DJs. What Split does is put the master output that everyone can hear into one ear in mono, kind of gangs the stereo together and puts it into one ear in mono, and in the other ear it puts whatever you've got pressed on the cue button. Some DJs are happy to DJ just in their headphones that way. Our tutor, Laidback Luke, who of course uses Denon gear, that's how he DJs. He has his earphones in and he listens to what the crowd can hear on one ear and what he wants to hear on the other one by pressing the cue buttons. And then he doesn't need any speakers to DJ with. He can DJ in silence uh, and or he can DJ in a festival with you know millions of watts of power going on around him. He doesn't care. Uh, and that's how he does it using the split button. As I say, it's good to see this on this device because it's not on an awful lot of DJ systems nowadays. So I promise you a look at the sweep effects. Let's do that now. Let's get this track playing here something like its normal speed. So the sweep effect 
Filter is the main one. Filter is the one you will hear and see on a lot of other DJ gear. Sometimes it's the only thing this knob does. And as you can hear there, this is taking it out of the mix. All the mid and high frequencies are slowly removed, leaving just the bass frequency. It's a little bit like going like this. But you only need one hand to do it, and it's a lot more musical. There's a resonance going on there. Kind of phasing that sounds quite pleasing. In the other direction, it's a high pass filter. which does the same thing, but in this instance, it's taking out the lows and the mids, leaving just the highs. A little bit like that. A big effect in dance music, of course, the filter. The next one is Echo. We get a couple of variations of the Echo. You can hear the, the Echo length and feedback changing as we move away from centre there. And we get more variations in that direction as well. The wash effect is really nice. This is a way of stopping the track using a nice echo out. You hear what happened there? Stop the track entirely. And in that direction, it stopped the, the track entirely as well. And there's just two different echo lengths. The echo length on the left is one beat, on the right is half a bit. Being really useful for transitioning between tracks. Noise adds noise over the top of the track. And you'll have heard this one in many an EDM set. And in the other direction, we get a different type of noise. Curious thing about these controls is, even if the deck's paused, you still get the noise effect. So you could have this deck playing here and be using the noise effect on another channel. It gets a nice effect just chopping it in over the top without actually having to turn down this channel to get that effect. Noise is the fourth of our sweep effects. So let's move on to the decks. The platters are capacitive. That means they're touch sensitive. You can touch them on the top. There's nothing moving there. It's just detecting the mi minute electronic, uh, you know, force field from your body, if you like, uh, from your fingers. The static is probably the right word. Uh, and that's touch sensitive there. Uh, we have got a vinyl button here, which turns it into a scratch mode like this when the track's playing. You can grab it like vinyl. Turn that off, and when the track's playing, it slows down and speeds the track up. When it's paused, it's always in that scratch mode. So you get two choices there. Even with vinyl mode on, by touching the plastic edge, you get the slowdown, and by touching the top, you get the scratch. So you've got the best of both worlds there with the vinyl button turned on. The platter display shows you various information. You've got the playhead position here. Uh, you can have loop size, you can have the current uh, number of the deck playing. I'll show you more about that a little bit later on. Now these buttons here decide whether we're on deck two or deck four for this side or deck one or deck three for this side, which correspond with decks two and four and decks one and three on the mixer. And that's how we can control four different decks on just two pieces of platter hardware. The track skip buttons here skip forwards and back through the tracks. So we can see our playlist here. We're going forward in the playlist and back in the playlist. An easy way of moving up and down your playlist to save you having to go here and load the tracks from here. If you're in the middle of playing a track, you can jump back to the beginning of the track by pressing that once, pressing it again, and it'll jump to the previous track. So it's a quick way of getting back to the currently playing track as well. So these two buttons here are called beat jump. I'm gonna load a track that's got a little bit more going on than that one. Uh, for this, so we have a beat going on there and beat jump will jump us forward in the track. Keep an eye on here, you can see we're jumping forward through this track by an amount, but the track still sounds cool, right? And the reason for that is it's jumping on beats or multiples of beats. What decides those beats or multiples of beats is what this knob is set to. And this knob gives us a number on the screen currently set to 16 so now beat jump will jump me back 16 beats 
I could set it to 32 and it would jump me forward or back a whole 32 beats. It's a very short track, this one. So this is a nice way of jumping musically forward or back through your track by bars. So 32 beats is eight bars, 16 beats is four bars. And so if you want to, for instance, shorten a track while you're actually DJing with it, you can use that button. And as long as the place you jump to is reasonably similar in sound to the place you're currently at, the audience probably won't notice. Beat jump as a creative tool is really useful. And it's nice to see it on really big buttons right down here. Now there is another use for beat jump. If we hold down shift while beat jump is pressed, we can use this to skip in a more conventional way through the track. So if you're in your headphones and you just want to find a part in the track, then that's probably an easy way of doing it, just holding down shift and pressing that, and it'll move through a whole track in just a few seconds. Now this button here is the sync button. Pressing it will turn it on. Pressing it again, it will turn it off. Uh, but you can also turn it off by holding down the shift button and pressing it. And there's a setting which will stop that being turned off when you press it for the second time if you want it that like that. If you don't want to accidentally turn it off, you can set it so you have to hold down shift to turn sync off. But there's two options there for the sync button. And of course, there's one on the other deck as well because you've got to be able to sync to something else. So the sync buttons are here just above the transport controls. Talking about the transport controls, let's move down now and start talking about these. So the Q button here, then when we're playing a track, will jump us back to the place where the cue was originally set on the track. It's a place in the track that you want to mark. So I'll press Q now, and it's jumped me back to the beginning. And this little marker here on the waveform is showing me these little triangles where the cue marker is set. The playback is now stopped, and I'm waiting again at the place that that cue was initially set. So if you want to move that cue point, well, that's easy. You just play a track, get to a place where you would like that cue point to be, like there, for instance, on that beat and you press Q again. It's now moved the Q point to there. Now if I'm playing the track and I press Q again, it'll jump back to that point ready for me to hit play. Really nice way of having a temporary point in the track that you can get back to really easily. So if you press Q on its own, it will start playing, but it's momentary. You see, if I press play, it'll play and continue to play. But if I press Q to get back to the Q point and then I press Q, it won't carry on playing. It's nice because you can use it to stutter, like that. But of course, now I've got to keep my hand on the button. But if I just touch the flashing play button, it will continue to play from where I had that cue point playing from originally. So cue can be turned into a full permanent play by just tapping the play button once you've uh, got the cue button held down. And one other nice function, which isn't on all DJ gear, and I like it on this, if you do want to set a new cue point, without stopping the track. So remember, if I want a cue point there, there, I need to stop the track and press it right. But if you want to set one while you're actually playing, then you can do that. You just hold down shift, and that cue point has moved to the new position now. And I didn't have to press stop for that to happen. Talking of stop, well, you've got that one nailed, haven't you? There it is, play and pause, play, pause. No mystery there. Now, moving on to the key lock and key sync functions, which are a big part of modern DJ gear. So this button here will activate or deactivate the key lock. So it's currently activated. That means I can slow the track down, get back to the beginning before it ends. It means I can slow the track down or speed it up and the pitch stays the same. If I turn that off, you can hear it's very low now because it's very slow. Back to normal. And as it gets higher, the pitch gets higher. So key lock will lock that pitch. It means that you can slow down tracks and speed them up and they don't sound quite so strange because when you speed a track up, it can get chipmunky. When you slow it down, it can get very deep. Uh, and that's a way of stopping that happening. Very a good algorithm in there that keeps the quality of the tune for most tunes as you move quite a long way away from the original pitch. So I've been using this control here, the pitch fader to demonstrate this stuff to you. You'll see it's got a light in the middle which locks on to tell us that we are at the central pitch and there's a bit of give there as well. So if you want the track playing just uh, at its normal pitch, you don't. there's no click but the light has got a, a bit where it doesn't move up or down uh, so it's easy to find it and easy to hit that first time. So the pitch bend buttons here 
will change the pitch while the track is playing. So if I want to momentarily slow it down, let's turn key lock off so it's more obvious. Hear that slowing down? Or speed it up. It's doing that. Now this is a bit of a legacy feature. This is something that was off and on DJ gear. They didn't have some of these good features for nudging and moving tracks around. Uh, but it's there so that you can keep the track in time with the other deck. A quick tap on there, if that track is speeding up in uh, relationship to the other deck, will get them back into time. Uh, and it's something that Denon has often left on its gear uh, when other manufacturers don't bother to include it anymore because a lot of DJs who've been DJing for a long time would miss that if it wasn't there. So the pitch bend buttons are there and that's what they do. Now, tracks have something called a beat grid laid on them. That is the lines that show you where the beats and the bars are. And you can actually adjust these grids. They're analyzed automatically for you, but you can adjust them. And the way you adjust them is down here in the edit grid area. You press and hold edit grid on the track. And once you've done that, we're into a mode here that lets us edit the grid. We can then press and hold the shift button and press that button again and then we're back to normal. So this is typically useful if you notice that a song is not analyzed pr properly, that maybe it's not got the first beat in the right place, or maybe another one of the classic areas is that the software thinks the song is, is twice the speed it is or half the speed it is. And it's really easy to correct with this. So we can correct this for twice and half speed by holding down shift and pressing either half or times two, these two buttons here. And we can correct where the markers are where the beat and bar markers are by pressing these two buttons here again without pressing shift and that will move the beat and bar markers all the way uh, up a beat or down a beat on your grid. So if you've ever beat gridded tunes you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. If you haven't it's one of these skills of DJ and we do cover it in quite some depth in our DJ course but it's not something I can go into too much depth here. Uh, on rather, um, rather only to say to you that it's a good thing to have. It ties your sync together, it ties your effects together because the effects that we're gonna look at in a little while uh, are tied to the beat and they cycle in time with the beat. So if that's wrong, then the effects aren't gonna sound right. So beat gridding is an important part of modern DJing. So this little button here, slip, is a really cool button because this lets you jump to cue points or trigger loop rolls or scratch while the track continues to play. And that means that if you've got two tracks in the mix but you're wanting to do something clever on one of them, it won't lose the timing. Much, much easier in this instance for me to just show you this. So this is the track playing normally. If I were to slow it down and start it again. On the waveform you can see that it's just moving to where I say and carrying on from where I leave off, which is what you'd expect. If I put slip mode on, keep an eye on that waveform, now you can see it's splitting the waveform in two. One half is showing what I'm doing and the other half is showing where the track would have been if I hadn't touched the platter. And that means you can do some nice little stuff like this. and the track will continue to play underneath and it will go back to the beat it would have been on. It's nice with little scratches, it's nice with dropping little bits of samples of, of um, cues in, which I'll show you a little bit later on. Uh, it's a good performance thing to have. And the reason it flashes like that is it can really throw you off if you forget that it's turned on. So that's flashing there telling me, turn me off. Um, you finished messing around now uh, and now the deck's back to normal mode. The sensor button plays the track momentarily backwards. Watch the screen. It's like playing the track backwards and also engaging slip at the same time. Really useful for getting rid of swearing, curse words and so on because you can hit it and instead of the curse word playing, the track plays backwards, take your hand off and the track's gone past the curse word when you take your hand off and it's where it would have been had you not pressed the button. Hold down shift and press the button, it'll play the track backwards. And now when we press the button again, the track will play forwards as normal from that point. Down in this area, we've got our performance pads. These have different functions depending upon what performance mode is set here. Hot cue, loop, roll, and slicer. I can 
Go to the other two, slice a loop and auto loop, by pressing the button again when I'm on that function. So these functions I'll explain more later on, just to let you know that the parameter buttons down here will cycle through various things going on on the pads. So sometimes there's more than eight things that you can control on a pad in a setting, and parameter will shift around within the, 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 the total number of things you can control. We'll talk more about that later. However, loop down here isn't the only place you can control loops. There's a loop area up here as well. Pressing down this encoder here will turn on a loop at the length that you see here and here. There's now a four beat loop set in that track and you can see the four beat loop looping away here. If I turn the encoder to the left, it halves the loop length. Again, halves again and so on. And to the right, it doubles the loop length. And the numbers again are gonna be shown here and here. If I want to move the currently set loop while it's still looping, I can hold down shift and turn the loop encoder and it moves the loop, but it re retains the place in the loop it was currently playing at. So it's a nice way of moving your loop through the track rhythmically. And you can see on the main waveform here, as I move it back, I'm moving back in the track and looping that part of the track. So turning the loop off is done by pressing the button again. And if you want to set a manual loop, you press the in button and the out button where you want to exit the loop and it will give you a manual loop there. And again, pressing the controller there will take you out of loop mode. Bear in mind that there are functions such as quantize and smart looping, which will affect the way that works. And we'll talk about quantize and smart looping a little bit later on. But if you've come from a background of using CDJs that didn't have beat looping, for instance, uh, some of the early CDJs didn't even have that, it was all manual. And you realize that you're hitting loop and then loops aren't dropping or ending where you think they should, it's probably because you've got quantize or smart looping set on. So just a little tip there. All right, we've looked at the mixer. We've looked at the decks. Now let's move on and look at the top sections. There's two effects areas, left and right, or one and two, which we've already looked at in regards to how you assign the channels to the effects areas. And then we've got the microphone and output and USB areas here to look at. So we'll look at all these now. We'll start with the effects. I'll look at effects one. It's exactly the same as effects two, so we don't need to look at them both individually. All you need to know is I'll start a track playing here. Let's uh, set a loop playing on this track so it carries on forever. It's on this channel. This channel is set to effect unit one. So to turn the effect that you've got selected with the effect selector here on, press the on button. And that's now turned on a reverb on this channel. To change the parameter of the currently selected effect, in this case decay, we turn this knob here. And if there's more than one parameter available, this will let you select the secondary parameter. But currently this is making the reverb kind of bigger. So I can turn the track off. And you can hear that's taking a long time to disappear from the mix. If that were set lower, we still have reverb there, but it's gone a lot quicker. So in this instance, parameter is decay. This control here is the frequency that is affected by the effect. So currently it's set to the whole track, which is what the bar means. But if I turn it to the left, the effect is now only on the low frequencies, which is what the bar filled in on the low frequencies here means. And the high frequencies are not being affected at all. In the other direction, it's the opposite. You can hear my kick drum and my bass line are fine there, but the high end is being affected by the reverb. This button here just resets it. These controls, the knob is wet dry, so it's just the amount. Wet is all on, dry is all off. It's like a rotary control for the on off. So when it's all the way down, it's like the off button's press, even though it's on. And these buttons here affect how quickly the effect cycles. Now in this instance, a decay doesn't have a rhythmic quality. So there's no, the rather a reverb doesn't have a rhythmic quality. So they're not lit up. But when we select the next effect, or one of the next effects, in fact, it's echo the next one, you'll see that now these are in play. We've got the word four beats there. And this echo could be a four beat echo, a two beat echo, a one beat echo. Let's leave it on one and turn it on. I'll turn the effects all the way up. There's a one beat echo going on there. If I press this again, I can halve it. The half beat echo. 
quarter beat echo, and so on. Again, this control here is a parameter in this instance. It's feedback, the number of times the echo echoes before it disappears. Have that lower and the echo goes away quicker. And the frequency control is the same on all of these effects. So there we're only echoing the top frequencies and there we're only echoing the bottom frequencies. The next effects, delay, hall echo and ping pong are variations on echoes and delays. So we'll move on to auto gate as the next one I want to show you. Auto gate is a little bit like doing this. It cuts the track in and out according to the beat setting here. So in and out on every beat. Now, you can hardly hear anything there, and that's because the wet dry is on full. Let's bring that back to about half. Now you're getting in and out on every beat. Now I can halve it. Now it's going in and out on every half beat. It's like doing the cross crater twice as quick. Quarter. Back to one. The next effect is the classic flanger effect. This effect works best when you have the beat setting quite high. Set it to eight beats uh, and turn it on so you can hear what it sounds like and we'll set it on full. Beloved of guitarists everywhere, right? The next one is the filter LFO. Let's set this back to, let's set this back to about there and to about two beats to show you this. So, that's a filter being turned on and off every two beats. Let's intensify it a little bit. The resonance just makes it sound more musical. Kind of more intense. And I can set that to four beats. And again, we've got the variations on that. It's similar to setting filter on here. And doing that, but it does it automatically for you. The next one, phaser, is very closely related to the flanger we just listened to. Bit Crush is a low fi effect. I really like Bit Crush, it sounds like this. I quite like this when you use the frequency control as well because you can kick out the high end and have those clean hi-hats. And have everything else affected by that kind of lo-fi quality. I like that one. Uh, roll takes a chunk of the track when you press that on button and loops it. So I could set this to one beat all the way on and hit roll. It's like locks that loop going. And then I've got control over mixing that with the original track. And again, with frequency, I've now let the baseline carry on like normal, but I'm looping the snares. Now I've got the claps going like normal, but I'm loop looping the bass line. Nice, fun effect to play with roll. Reverse roll, same thing as roll, but in, back in reverse. Beat break is an interesting one. It applies a cut pattern, a bit like the transformer or the gaze effect that we looked at a second ago that was cutting the crossfader in and out. But it applies a pattern that you have set on this parameter here over the whole track. So let's put it all the way on. See these little colored blocks? They show you the pattern that's gonna be used. So there's loads and loads of these little patterns. Let's just turn the thing on and have a listen. Quite a uniform one. bit more triplicity there. It's effectively giving you new rhythms with the rhythm you've already got. 
depending on the source material, some of these will work better than others for you. It can work quite nicely with vocals, especially a cappella, just to chop the a cappella off and add a bit of interest to it. It's an interesting one pattern. Uh, beat break. Scratch, uh, no idea. I've never managed to get my head around this one. It basically scratches the track forward and backwards, but I've never heard any scratch DJ making noises like this effect makes. But let's just turn it on so you can hear it. And turn it up to two beats. And down to half a beat. Yeah, scratch. Uh, and we're back to the beginning there. So the effects are pretty powerful there and you get a lot of control over them and the same on the other side, as I said. Moving on to the microphone sections. So you have two microphones here, on and off for each. Each microphone has its own level control and each microphone has its own EQ. The top mic has a three band EQ, the bottom mic has a two band EQ. This knob here is for the echo effect that you can turn on for either mic one, mic two or both. Uh, and this is the intensity of it. Just to add a bit of reverb, if you've got someone on a microphone singing or emceeing and you want to give them a bit of presence to their voice, you can dial that in there. The talk over button will automatically duck down the volume, not literally on the fader, but duck down the volume in the background when you talk and when you finish talking, the volume comes back up again. And there's a way of deciding how much that ducks down in the utilities menus, which we're going to be looking at a little bit later on anyway. But that's how you turn that function on. Moving over to this side, the master volume is what it says, controls the master volume. This area here is quite unique, it's the zone output. By pressing channel assign here, the screen warns us this will stop playback on deck four. Main mix will no longer be sent to zone out. So what's it talking about there? Well, if I press continue now, that light will come on. Now, on this channel here, I can play a playlist from my music, which will then be sent via the zone output on the back, and it can go to somewhere completely different. It can go to another room in your venue, and it can be playing background music. So for instance, if you're a wedding DJ and you're playing the main reception, but there's also another room off somewhere, dining or whatever, you can have a playlist playing in there, and it gets its own volume control and its own EQ, while you're DJing on the other three channels in the main room. So effectively, it turns it into a two-zone controller. Uh, so that's what zone is. Press that off again. It will tell us that this is going to give us back channel four. And now channel four is back working with us in the main mix. Really useful feature. These knobs here control the booth output. It's another output on the back. So there's three outputs on the back, master, booth and zone. Booth output is typically for the speakers right near you. If you're playing in a club or a venue where the speakers are a long way away, you tend to have speakers near you. And this gives you independent volume and EQ for those speakers that are near you. This section here is our media. So we have an SD card and that light is lit because in there I have an SD card which is providing the music we're hearing at the moment. There's lights here for USB 1 and USB 2 where you can plug in removable USBs. And if you want to eject any of these, you press the eject button and on the screen, it will give you a list of everything you've currently got plugged in, which in my case is only the digital DJ tips music library there. I don't want to eject that, so I'll just press it again, and then you eject the one that you want. And finally, for the top of the unit, a quick way of getting to the source menu on here is just to hold shift and press this button here, and then it'll give you this source list so you can look at what you want to play your next track from quite easily. Moving around to the front panel, the headphones, eighth and quarter inch, are on the far left. Then we have our input selectors for the four channels that decide whether the channel is going to be playing back music in the software, music from your USBs, or music from the units plugged in around the back, which we'll be looking at closely in a second. So CDJs, turntables, that kind of thing. And those buttons will sort that out for you. You can choose which decks are controlling which music source. Moving further to the right, the fader start buttons decide whether the decks which are assigned to the left or right hand of the crossfader auto start, something that mobile DJs have liked in the past. I've never seen anyone using that, but it's there to auto start the decks if you want. You're more than likely to just leave that turned off. However, you will be using the crossfader contour for sure, because you'll find a way that that works for you. Crossfader contour sets the, co the crossfader to either smooth fading between the tracks or basically a switch. Let's take a closer look at crossfader contour. I'll start a track playing on here and I'll fade it out. Now, with crossfader contour set to smooth, this will take a long time to come in. 
Even in the middle, it's noticeably quieter than there. Down here, you really can't hear it at all. Now, if I set crossfader contour to sharp, this is like a switch. Tiniest movement, full volume. And that's effectively doing nothing. It's an on-off switch. Scratch DJs like this because it gives them the control they need to quickly turn the track on and off when they're scratching. However, house DJs prefer it set somewhere smoother so that the blend between two tracks that they happen to be playing are, are a lot smoother. Rather than the all or nothing. That you get with the switch. Personal choice is gonna dictate how you have that set. So now we've looked at the features of the unit, I wanna move on to looking at the way of using it, the operation. And I'm gonna first start by looking at the way the track over, overview and waveforms and library area work up here on the screen. And then we're gonna move and look at some of the controls that we haven't covered at all because I said I'd look at them later. Specifically, one of the big areas we haven't looked at is the performance pads, but we'll also look at some other stuff we haven't covered before moving on to finish by looking at some of the menus that are available in the unit for the utilities and preferences and so on. And at the very end, we're gonna look at how to use streaming services with this. Let's start off by looking at this track overview and waveform. Here we have the waveform for the currently selected track from beginning to end. Here we have the selected track on the other deck from beginning to end. Here we have a zoomed in section of the waveforms of all four tracks. I have tracks loaded on all four decks at the moment. The two at the top are shown depending upon where the deck button is. So deck one is now shown at the top, deck three is now shown at the top deck two at the top and deck four at the top. The little icons at the very top here are called the toolbar. And if I swipe down on here, I get access to that toolbar. I'll talk to you more about what goes on in there in a little while, but just know that there's a swipe down there to see more of that. So my hot cue points are shown on my tracks by these little signs here. That's the hot cue that I've just set on that track there. And the waveforms also show hot cues. You can see hot cues set here on this track on the waveform itself. It's duplicated in both places. If I have a loop set on a track, that's also going to show here and here. And I have the loop at different sizes. You'll see the loop is changing size in both places. The little circular icon here is sync. I press sync on a deck, that will come on. I press sync again on a deck and that will go off. It tells you the deck is synced to the master deck. More about all of this stuff coming up. This is just a quick overview of what you can actually see here. So the time here is the time elapsed or remaining. I press play on that track. You can see that's the time remaining and that's the time elapsed and it's looping at the moment. And that will allow you to make that choice in case you need to know, for instance, how long you've got le left before you want to mix something out. So the BPM counters are these four numbers here, 126, 126, 121, and 119. The little number here, or the number in the letter, 8A, 10B, 8A, 3B, is the key shown at the moment in Camelot notation, but we can change that key to be showing in other notations in the preferences. We'll get to all of that stuff later. In the middle of all of these is the, this is a playhead. This is a part that's actually being played at the moment in the track. So I hit play on this deck here. Turn it up. The bit we're hearing is the bit that this line is currently at. There's a big drum coming there. I'll let go of the crossfader again, of the jog wheel again. We'll hear that, that beat. There you go. So this is the part we're currently at in the track. And we can also see the part we're currently at, at in the track at the top here as well. The little lines down here are marking beats and the big lines are marking bars. And this is to do with the beat grid. This is something we've already looked at how to adjust by using the beat grid settings down here. And we can also adjust it and analyze for that in the engine software. And this little area here where it says four is the loop, the currently selected loop, si loop size. 
and whether the loop is on or off. You see that this got brighter when I turned the loop on here and the loop showed on the deck. We looked at that a little bit earlier on as well. We also looked at the fact that it also shows in the middle of the display as well. And that's everything that we've got going on in this screen here. Let's look at some of the things we can do here. So when a track is paused, we can move through the track like this. And then we hit play again and it'll play from that point. Now you can't do that when the track's playing. You have to pause to do that. So it saves you doing that by mistake. But there is a setting to change that, which we'll get to a little bit later on. You can actually change the key of a track, which is pretty cool. As long as you've got key lock switched on here, by tapping the little key icon, we get this display at the top, which lets us move up or down. Which is really useful for matching the key between tracks that you want to play. I've already shown you this for two deck, but let's look at it for four now. Holding shift and pressing view, we'll switch to a horizontal waveform four deck view. We only get two waveforms zoomed in here. We get all four waveforms in our full waveform view where we see the whole track. Now I started to show you this toolbar menu. Let's zoom down here and see what we've got. We have quantize, which is a way of enabling or disabling the feature that snaps to the nearest beat or bar marker when you press cues or loops and keeps your mixing tight if your timing's a little bit off. And that will snap to either the nearest beat or bar marker or a fraction thereof, depending on how you have this set in the settings, which we'll look at a little bit later. So this is gonna give us the status of that on or off. The next one, continue, decides whether the next track plays automatically or not when you're in a playlist without you doing anything. The next one opens the record window. We'll talk a little bit more about the record window in a little while. And the final setting is the stop time of the deck. And I can show you this one now. So the stop time of the deck decides how quickly the deck slows down when you hit the stop button. You hear that sounded a little bit like a record stopping. And I can make that bigger. sounding more like a turntable being actually turned off there. Or if it's not to your taste to have that stuff, you can turn it all the way off. And you get that instant stop. Now I'm gonna go back to the vertical menu here, and I'm also going to go to the utility menu, and we're gonna talk more about this in a little while, and just turn off decks three and four for the moment, because I want to give you a better view of this area here. We're back to the view that we have been looking at earlier in this video tutorial. And the reason I wanted to do that was just to make this a bit bigger so it's easy for you to see some of the things I'm going to point out to you now in the centre, which is where we've got the library preview. Now, an alternative way of loading tracks is just to swipe them. Swipe this to the left, and it says load left there. And as I let go of it, it loads onto the left deck. Swipe this one to the right, it says load right. And as I let go to it, it, of it, it loads onto the right hand deck. The full library can be opened by tapping this button here. So this is the full library view, and we'll use this to view our whole library, including our filters, our crates, our playlists, our prepare window, and so on. You can do a lot more in here than you can do in the central library view that we looked at in the last little screen. So this screen here, there's a few extra things that we can do. We've got crates, playlists, including history, We've got a prepare window where we can add tracks that we want to play very soon. We can look through our files, a bit like looking through files on an operating system. And we've got a very powerful search down here as well. If I want to add a track to this prepare window here, which has currently got nothing in it, it's really easy. I go to any playlist. Here's a playlist of mine that I had earlier just to get something back showing here. I'll talk to you about playlists in a minute we just swipe it to the left. So I'm, I'm in the middle of a set and I think I want to play that next. Well, we just swipe it to the left. See, it says prepare, re to release to accept. That's now in the prepare window here. It's the DJ equivalent in the modern world of pulling tracks halfway out of your record box, if you ever remember doing that, adding them to a prepare window. Slightly confusingly, maybe, when we're in this mode and we swipe a track to the right, 
its load and now it's going to say which deck do we want to load it on left or right because I've just shown you swiping to the left is adding it to a prepare window. So that's a two-step process for loading from the main library. So let's talk about, go back to the main library and talk about these icons down here. The one at the top is a quick switch icon for whatever you've got availability on, on this unit. So we've got my local music on the SD card, but we've also got some streaming services. And towards the end of this video tutorial, I'll talk to you about streaming services and how they work in this system. But that icon there does that. That's something that's been added to it since launch. So the other icons have been here ever since the beginning. The first one is crates. Now, you've got crates and playlists, and a lot of DJs are quite confused by this because no other software that I can think of has both, but they're actually pretty cool when you get your head around it. So I'll talk you through the principle of these, and then we'll have a look at them on the screen. A crate is a section of your music library that you've decided to keep in one place. So imagine real records. Imagine you had a, a wall of vinyl, and you had that vinyl sorted out alphabetically, or by year, or by genre, or whatever and it's all in one place. Well, that, think of that as, as, as crates. Uh, and you had another wall of vinyl. <laughs> that you, these are great days, aren't they, with walls of vinyl. You had another wall of vinyl that was your home listening music you don't really normally DJ with. Well, that's two separate crates. DJ music, home listening music. You might have a crate for club and for chill out, or you might have a crate for main room music and bar music. But they're divisions that are big and that you don't have any order other than year, genre, date, you know, uh, release date, whatever. They're just big chunks of your music. And you can't have a record, you can't have a tune in both, in, in, in more than one crate. They exist in one place. That's what crates are, they're big divisions. So for instance, here I've got tunes from our production tutor, Joey. And the reason I've got those is I can use them in this tutorial without getting in copyright problems. Uh, thanks, Joey. Uh, so I might have another crate in here, if this was my working folder, called my DJ tunes. So I'm never going to want to to mix and match those. They're two separate areas of, of kind of my music world. So that's what crates are. Now, playlists are very different. Playlists are selections of tracks that you've got for a particular purpose. So for instance, here, I've got some tracks I'm looking at for one of my forthcoming sets, uh, a Balcony Beats live stream. And these are tracks that we can organize in any way we want. We can change the order within the playlist. So think of this as more like a creative list of tracks. And you can have tracks in lots of playlists here. So they work in a slightly different way. And it is a little bit confusing, but if you try and think of it, the record analogy, you've got your crates, which are your big sections of your music, and you've got your playlist, which is when you take them out and put them to go and do a certain job with. Of course, the beauty of digital is that in playlists, we can have that same track in all kinds of playlists. And the history area is another example of a playlist where it's just got the history of what you've played. And of course, a track can be in there and still be in your current playlist. So try and think of it that way. So that's playlists. We've already looked at prepare. These are tracks that I've got ready to play now. And this is the file system that is letting me look in the same way, as I said a second ago, if you're in a operating system on a computer, you go to your hard drive and then your U and then your music. This is exactly the same thing. It's just a way of browsing around inside the file system. Uh, and as we said before, we've got the very powerful search function down here. You've seen me tapping on these, but you don't have to. You can use the browse knob when we're in this view as well to move through these. If you put your finger on a track and hold it, it will give you extra information about that track. So the artwork would be here if I had artwork on my tracks. We've got the BPM and the key and the time, track artist, genre, and all the other stuff about that track is showing here. You can even have comments on the track as well, which you add over in Engine. A couple of things I want to show you on playlists and crates that we haven't looked at before. So I've gone to a crate here, and at the top we have this year. And I can click on year, and it gives me all the other ways I can organize that crate. Title, artist, rating, BPM, or whatever. Change to BPM, and now they're in BPM order. If I go to the playlist section, well, I've still got this button at the top, but it's got an extra selector called play order. And this is the order I select. So in other words, I can have playlists in any order I want, and I can sort by that, or I can sort by any of the others as well. Uh, but I, I get the chance to define an order of tracks in the playlist that I can't do in crates. So just trying to explain to you a bit more about the difference between the two. There's another cool thing here as well. I told you earlier about zone, right? I press zone. It says this will stop playback on deck four. Main mix will no longer be sent to zone out. Yes, we want to do that. Now the fourth channel 
is going to contain a playlist I send to it, which will go off to a different area of the club or the venue while I'm DJing in the main room. So how do we choose which music is going to go there? Well, at the top here, we now have a send to zone, which appears when we turn zone on. I can press send to zone. That's now going to start playing that list over in that zone. And the rest of the controller is available to me to carry on doing what I'm doing. Let's have a closer look at the center part in the platter. It shows us the artwork for the currently selected track. It also shows us the play position like this for the currently selected track. So if I grab the jog wheel, you can see the play position is stopping and playing on like that. If I press the slip button, then notice it carries on showing me where the play position would have been had I not pressed slip with the blue circle there, which is pretty cool. And if I press loop, we've already seen this, it gives me the loop number for the currently selected loop, the number of beats that's currently being looped when I hit that button. So all these things are there for me. And finally, I'm going to go back into the utility menu and quickly select four decks again, because I want to show you that it changes to tell me the deck I'm on. Deck one, deck three, you see that? One, three. So as well as the color changing, I also get that visual representation of the deck I've just switched to in the center of the display as well. Now let's take that close look at the way search and filter works. So by tapping the search button at the bottom here, this keyboard comes up. And on the keyboard, I can now type in my search query, for instance, Calvin Harris. So I'll start typing, and very quickly, you can see it's filtering the tracks. I can already see some Calvin Harris tracks there after three, three taps. CALV and I've got some Calvin Harris tracks, the only ones in my collection there, Im immediately. So it searches very, very quickly. It searches artist and title by default, but you can change that. By tapping the little arrow at the top here, we can set what it's searching in. So it could also be searching in the comment, could be also searching in the file name, uh, whatever. You can set what you want here. Just be aware that the more things you set here, the more time it's gonna take to do your search and then we can get out of there and we're back to the normal search area. By tapping the little keyboard icon there, I get rid of the keyboard. So I can also filter the tunes and this is how filter works. By tapping, for instance, the artist here, I now get a list of all the artists in my collection so I can very quickly search through the artist for the one I wanted. So in this case, if I wanted Calvin Harris, I'll search through here, find him in my list of artists and tap on there, and there's Calvin Harris on his own, there's Calvin Harris with Sam Smith to give the tracks that I have from there. And you can do this by all kinds of criteria as well, search by BPM, you can search by key, you can search by album. Uh, key's an interesting one, let's look a bit more deeply at this. So here we can set search for instance for key 10A. So notice that in the results here for key 10A, I've got the 11A and 9A as well, and there should be some 10Bs tucked in there somewhere too, there's a 10B. That's because it's set to tell me compatible keys as well as tracks in the same key. All those tracks should mix fine with the track in 10A. And you can change that behavior, which we'll look at when we get to looking at the deep menus in a little while. It's the same with BPM, actually. In the BPM settings, if I was searching for 120 BPM, at the moment, you'll see I'm getting tracks at 119, 122, 123, and so on. And that's because it's set to have a tolerance of three or four BPM or something at the moment, but you can change that again in the settings. Now you can also search within these results. So if I wanted to find my house music, let's set genre there and turn off the other two. If I wanted to find my house music within that BPM search by typing house now, it's now filtered it down to only my house tracks within there. So that's got rid of any other stuff around those BPMs that doesn't happen to be house music. So just beware that you can combine filters and searches to get closer to what you're looking for. You can make crates and playlists on the unit itself and you can reorder tracks in playlists as well. Let's have a look at how to do that. I'm gonna press the playlist icon here and I'm gonna press the little pen at the top. And now I'm gonna click create playlist. I can also create folders to put playlists in. Give it a name. And now I can select tracks that I wanna put in that playlist. So if I don't wanna get tracks from here, I can turn off the edit function there, go to somewhere else like my main music library, click the edit button again, and these little circles next to the tracks, 
I can scroll through here, finding tracks that I want to add. Now when I'm ready to add them, I go back to the playlist library so that the playlist is showing there and I grab any of the tunes by holding my hand on it and then pull. And you can see that it's got the number three here telling me that I'm actually moving three tracks. Hover over test two, let go and it says added. And now when I stop edit and click on that playlist, you can see I've got those tracks there. I can also reorder those tracks. Again, click edit and then in the edit mode, just pull them around to where I want them in the playlist like that. So earlier on in operations, I did show you how a lot of the basic queuing and playing and transport controls work. But if you've jumped straight to this point in the video, we're going to have like a 30 second recap of how the basic controls work here to play, pause, cue and so on. So let's do it. To play a track, hit play, to pause, press it again. To scratch a track while the platter is moving and the track's playing, we grab like this. As long as the vinyl button is on with the vinyl button off, that is a nudge. To nudge the track, even with the vinyl button on, we use the edge. So to set a cue point while the track is playing, we can hold down shift and press Q. And to jump to that cue point after we've done it, we press Q. And we're at the beginning waiting to play again. To start the track again, we press play. If we jump to the cue point like this, we can play the track momentarily. To play it continually, hold down Q and press play. If you want to jump back to the cue point while you're playing, hold down shift and press play. So the sensor button is reverse, but with slip mode attached. So it's going backwards. It's where it would have been had I not pressed the button. Backwards, where it would have been had I not pressed the, pressed the button. And you can see what's going on in the middle of the jog wheel as well. To get reverse without that shift and press the button, let go, press it again and you're back to forward. To skip to the previous or next track, we pause and press track skip. Beginning of this track, previous track, next track, next track, next track. If you are playing, that won't happen, although you can change things in the settings to make that happen. To jump backwards or forwards, we press beat jump. If we press shift and backwards and beat jump, it will skip through the track without us being able to hear it. To enable or disable slip mode, press slip. When we've done that, we can do stuff on the decks and it will be as if we never touch them as soon as we take our hands off them. For instance, and again, we've looked at all this before. It's just a summary for people who might have jumped straight here. To jump to a specific section in a track, when we're paused, we can move like this and then when we hit play, it will be at that section. We can do that when we are playing the track with a change in the settings, but also we can do that by holding the jog wheel. Now, even with the jog wheel held, we can do that there. It's the same as pausing the track. It, the unit treats that as the same as pausing the track. That's actually called needle lock. And again, I'll show you where to change the way that behaves in a little while. And just for completion's sake then, let's just have another quick look at the looping function for people coming from other controllers. Tap to loop, left to halve, right to double, tap again to take the loop out, manual loop in, manual loop out, and holding down the shift button while we turn this is a loop jump, skipping the loop around now within the track. Now let's look in some detail at the sync tempo, pitch and key functions of this unit. So if I want to sync two tracks, I need to have the first track playing and press the sync button, which lights up the sync indicator up here and tells me that this is now ready to go. On the other deck, again, I press the sync button and when I'm ready to DJ, to mix in, I hit the play button on here. They're both now playing and they're both in sync and we know that because these two sync Icons have got that bar through the middle of them that you can see. Now they will be in sync when I mix. Now, if I was to mess around with this track, slow it down a bit, you'll see that the sync icon has disappeared from there. The line has disappeared from the sync icon. It means they're still in the same speed at the same BPM. But the speed, but the beats are no longer aligned. Hit sync and sync flashing to tell me that. Hit sync again. 
and the beats have aligned again. So just bear in mind that you've got two sync modes there, BPM sync and full sync lock of the beats. Two ways to deactivate sync, just hit sync, or if that doesn't work, press shift and sync. There's a setting that will let you change that that we'll look at in a little while. So to adjust the track's pitch, we use the pitch faders. Now, this will work when you've got two decks synced, two playing together there. They're both slowing down together now. And speeding up together. If that deck isn't synced with this one, this is only going to affect the deck that I'm currently playing. So just bear in mind that if you've got decks synced, then of course moving the pitch radio on one of them is going to move the pitch on all of them because otherwise they wouldn't be in sync. I can alter the way that this speeds up or slows down the track by holding shift and pressing the pitch bend buttons to access this function range. Anything written underneath a control is accessed by the shift button. And this is the percentage range that the track speeds up or slows down when I pull this. So let's speed it up. It's currently on 10, 20, even 50. It goes up to 100. Let's leave it at 50. So I can show you a big change in tempo here. And it's got very high as well, hasn't it? Let's go down. And it's now playing very low. The note's gone down as well as the tempo, of course. If I press key lock, the tempo will still change, but it'll hold it at the same pitch. In other words, it's locked the pitch or the key. A very powerful feature, and one that's used a lot by DJs when mixing harmonically, for instance. Now, by holding your finger on the key lock button, you can tell that deck to key sync with the other deck. In other words, it will alter the pitch of the deck you hold that button down on to make the pitch the same as the other deck so that the two work together harmonically. It could be a risky business because it might move the track too far high or low and it might sound a bit weird, but you can do it. And the way you do that is, let's get a track loaded on the other deck that isn't in the same key because these are two in the same key. These are both in 8A. Let's pick something in a, another key. Let's grab this track here and load it onto the right hand deck. So, by holding down key lock here, it's changed the key of that track and the minus one there means it's moved it down a note and that's okay. That means this track will work perfectly in key now with the track I've got playing on this deck. And so that's a nice way of matching your tracks in the mix so that you don't get harmonic clashes. But do check when you're doing that, that it hasn't moved the track too far up or down because more than one or two notes can sound a bit weird. Holding down shift and pressing key lock, you see it's flashing to tell me the key has been changed. We'll reset that back to the key it was originally in. Again, just like normal sync, you need to have at least two decks playing in order for that to work because otherwise it doesn't know what to sync it to, right? That stands to reason. All right, let's now do one of the big things that we haven't done so far, which is look at the performance modes, the pads down here on this console. I'll concentrate on this deck here. They're both exactly the same, of course. So hot cues let us do exactly what the cue button here that we already know about does, but permanently. When I set hot cues on my track and I get eight of them, they'll still be there. When I load this track again in the future, they're kept with the track information. So it's a permanent, Q, if you like. Quite often DJs like to put one at the beginning of their track and that's now set at the beginning of the track. I can jump back to it. If the track's paused, it will wait at the beginning. If it's playing, it will play from the beginning. A slight difference in behavior to the temporary Q point as well. Set another one. I've now set eight cue points, and you can see them on the track. So these are all my cue points on the track here, set in different places, and I can jump between them like this. To delete a cue point, hold down shift and press the cue button like this. The next performance mode is loop. These pads can each contain a loop. And to put a loop on a pad, you press the start point and the end point. That's now immediately looping that region, which you can see on the display. To get out of that loop, just press it again, 
and it's gone, but it's remembered it here. I can get back to it just by tapping that. Let's set another one. There's a one beat loop. Looping now, we're out of it, but I can get back to it by pressing it. This can be any length you want. Out of it, back to it. I can set a loop here, like we've seen before. Let's set a half beat loop there, or maybe a one beat or a two beat, or let's set a quarter beat loop, really fast one. And let's save it onto this slot. The system doesn't mind where you set the loop. Press again, we're out of that loop, press and we're back to it. So we can also use the parameter buttons to alter our loops. When we're in a loop, we can halve the length of it or double the length of it by pressing these parameter buttons. If we hold down shift and press the parameter buttons, we can move the whole loop forwards or backwards in the track, loop move. So it's similar to the loop move function. In fact, it's exactly the same as the loop move function we saw up here on the auto looping area earlier on. By pressing the loop button again, we go to auto loop and these lights are green. Now this automatically loops by a value depending upon the button you press. That's a quarter beat loop. Loop roll is a slit plus a predetermined loop length. It works nicely with short loop lengths. The green ones are the kind of standard ones. So you'll know this sound as soon as I do it. You'll have heard it before. What it's doing is using the loop length that it's set, lower loops are this side, higher loops are this side also applying slip mode which you can see on the screen so it's a nice way of adding a bit of fun to a track while not interrupting the flow of the track these ones here are triplet values it's a musical term that is different to the halving and doubling of the loop length that is half the size of that is half the size of that is half the size of that but these are different, these are triplet values. They've got a musical quality to them that's awesome. It sounds like this. That one's a little bit too fast to even tell. Just think of it as something which isn't quite the same as halving and doubling. And if in doubt, just use these green ones for your loop roll mixing. The slicer mode is an interesting one for performance DJs. I'm actually going to press it twice to go to slicer loop. And the reason is it's easier to demonstrate it to you with slicer loop. And then I'll tell you what slicer does. So let's start this new track I've loaded playing. Have a look at the screen here. Notice how we have got a locked part of the track and it's moving through that lock part of the track in little slices. And I can jump around in those slices by pressing the buttons. These buttons here represent those eight beats. So I'm kind of slicing up that section of the track by pressing these pads. And when I press the pad, it will start playing at the beat that that pad is referring to on the screen. This is the first beat of the eight beat section. This is the fifth beat. And you can hear it's got that slip quality as well. It's carrying on playing the, the, the eight beat section underneath. Now, the length of these little loops that it's triggering can be altered by holding down the parameter button. That's now gonna be double the length and double again. You can even do it while you're touching a button. And it will still go back to this pattern. A way of making that eight beat section move through the track and not be static, well, that's just a normal slicer. And that's the difference between slicer and slicer loop. Now these are in blue. This eight beat section here, you can hear the track's changing. That's because the track's actually playing but I still get the chance to slice up bits of the track here.
and so on. You can get quite creative with Slicer, especially if you find a piece of music that lends itself to being chopped up like that on the fly. So let's go back to the screen. And a really big part of this tutorial is looking through all these menus. Pressing and holding the view button, remember, brings up the menu panel. And here we have utility, preferences, source, and record. So let's start looking through these in order. So in utility, we get lots of device settings that we can change. So the first setting turns decks three and four on and off. Set it to off, and we're back into a two deck mode. And that means that we don't have to worry about the extra decks. We get a bit more screen room. A lot of people only like to DJ with two decks. Of course, this unit has Wi-Fi. This turns the Wi-Fi on or off, and we can open the Wi-Fi here and look at the different settings that are available, join networks, and so on. Nudge sensitivity is how sensitive nudging a track is like this. It's on high at the moment. Set it to max. I can probably stop the track by spinning it backwards. Yeah. Set it to low and you won't be able to do that. So it's just how much you want it to move when you hit nudge. The platter touch sensitivity is how much you have to press down to get this to work. If you're having issues with it, you can hit calibrate and calibrate this there. So the screen brightness is exactly what we would imagine. It's making our screen really bright, good for playing at barbecues and in the sunshine, and very low, good for when you're under studio lights and you don't want to rush out your cameras with, uh, with too much screen brightness. So then we're into the mixer settings. So here we've got the microphone and there's lots and lots of settings for the microphone. Talk over is about this button here. When we turn this on, how much is it going to dim the music? Well, talk over is the is the setting which will arrange that for us how we want it. The mic talk over resume is how quickly the music returns when we stop talking on the microphone with talk over on. In other words, how quickly does it fade the music back up? Mobile DJs will be loving this, right? Because there's an awful lot of stuff here that you can do that is really useful if you use mics a lot at weddings and so on, especially this one, mic threshold. This is how loud the mic's gotta be before the talk over kicks in. Then you have mic attenuation. In other words, this is kind of like the level controls but for the microphone, so you can get your microphones balanced if they're different volumes. Send mic to booth is a nice one. This decides whether when you speak in a microphone, it comes out of the booth loudspeakers or not. It can help to prevent feedback by turning that off. Send main mix to zone out. We talked about that earlier. Zone out crossfade time is a nice one. If you've got a playlist playing on your zone out on the fourth channel, it can do some auto mixing between the tracks, at least cut the gaps out for you between the tracks. Set that to a second or two just to keep the music flowing more and more smoothly. And the master limiter is a fail safe that says, look, if you push everything too loud on this, you've got all your gains high, you've got your master volume very high and it's starting to distort, well, the master limiter will hold that back. It doesn't mean you're going to sound any better, but well, you will sound a bit better. You're much better off managing your levels instead of just pushing everything to the max. But for instance, if you're DJing with other people and you don't think they know how to keep the volumes in rain, you can set that to protect the speakers further down the line. So worth knowing you've got that there. Now we're moving on to the EQ types and this is a, a good thing, good time for me to demonstrate this to you. So remember earlier when we played a track and I showed you the EQs, you can still hear them down there, right? Well, that's because the EQ was set to normal, not isolate. We set it to isolate. It's cut everything dead. It's two different types of EQs. House DJs tend to prefer this type because they get more control. More open format DJs might prefer the slightly less harsh, you know, having that, leaving at least some volume going on there as opposed to nothing. When you've got it set to isolate, you can also set the frequencies that the low crosses over to the mid and the mid crosses over to the high. And these are both set here. Again, house DJs might like that, tuning it to, to work with different systems so that you get total isolation when you kill the bass, for instance, uh, by setting that bass one at the level that's right to do that and so on. So there's some pretty advanced controls there for DJs who like to work the EQs. So filter resonance is all about the filter we have on here. By setting the resonance higher, it's a bit like setting the resonance higher when I was showing you on the main effect. Let's get that back to the beginning. There's a lot of musicality there, that. Turn it down and it's a bit more like 
just the EQ. I like to have that quite high, I like the sound of filters. So the filter extreme type says, what happens when the filter's there? Or there? Do we want it to still be playing a bit? If so, set it to bleed. Still some bass there, although if you're watching this on your phone, no chance. But the top, still a little bit of top going on up there, as opposed to kill, which just wipes it out when you get to the extremes of the filter. Noise sweep volume is something a lot of DJs will be very happy with because it controls this effect. Or more specifically, how loud that is. We could have that quite low. Because remember, this is putting a noise in over the top. There's no tracks playing here. It's an effect that adds some noise. Or we can have it really high. Whoa, deafening me in the studio. So that means that if we want to add that noise effect over a track, We get to choose how loud it is in comparison with the track we're listening to. Headphone gain gives you the overall vol volume in your headphones. If your headphones are particularly quiet or loud, you can set the headphone gain there so that you get a more useful set of volumes from the level control. And Q Solo decides whether you're allowed to have more than one Q button pressed at once. At the moment, it's set not to Q Solo. So I can listen in my headphones to all four tracks at once if I want. But if I set that to on, by the time these are off, now I can't do that. Now it's gonna switch from the currently set one to the new one when I press one. Some DJs prefer it that way, I think I do as well, because you don't have to, you know, you're probably only gonna to wanna to ever listen to one track at once in your headphones and it just turns any others off uh, if you've got it set that way. So the next menus are all about the streaming services. Turning these on will make them appear in the main menu here as options. Oops, as options. If you are in here and you turn those off, they're not gonna appear in the top there. No streaming services. So basically you're gonna turn on the ones that you're subscribed to there. And then we just have information about the unit here, the model, check for updates to your firmware. We're currently fully updated because I only did it today and the nuclear reset button at the bottom there if you just want to get the unit back to factory settings to sell it or if you're having problems or whatever. Okay, so let's now go to the preferences menu and start talking through some of the stuff you've got here. Pressing save to my drive will take all the settings that you have on this unit and save them to the currently selected drive, in this case my SD card, which means we can take them back to Rekordbox. It's a nice way of keeping your settings the same from unit to computer to another unit and so on. Track start position decides whether when you load a track, it starts at the very beginning of the recording or at the first cue point. Default speed range decides how much you speed up or slow down a track by default before you've made any changes on the range here. Sync mode decides whether sync is gonna give us the full beat sync like I showed you or just tempo. Some DJs prefer just tempo because they're used to DJing in that way. The sync button action is the one I told you about where we can only turn sync off by holding shift and pressing sync if this is set. And if it's set to toggle, pressing sync a second time will turn it off, another time will turn it on and so on. Now these pitch buttons here, as we know, have got two functions. Range, which sets the pitch range of this, and bend, which slows down and speeds it up. Here, you can change that. If I set it to range, then this is gonna change the pitch range without me having to hold down shift. Some people never use the pitch bend. So if you don't use a pitch bend, it makes sense to make that change so you're not having to hold down shift when you wanna make these changes. Now, these are little things, but they are stuff that you'll find useful over time. Then we're into cues and loops. So cue and loop quantization, this is all about when you hit Q to set a cue point, or when you hit loop to set a loop, is it gonna do it exactly when you pressed it, or is it gonna to jump to the nearest beat or the nearest fraction of a beat to kind of tidy up your timing a bit? You can set the amount it jumps to there, everything from four beats to one beat all the way down to an eighth of a beat. Let's go to track playing to demonstrate the next one. Let's set a couple of hot cues. 
Okay. That's momentary. When the track is paused, the hot cue will play just while I'm holding it. And it'll stop. With the track's playing, of course it'll continue to play. So depending on whether you're pausing or playing, depends on what the hot cues do. If I set it to trigger, well now pressing this will trigger the hot cue and it will play from there full stop. Again, some DJs prefer it one way, some DJs prefer it another way. One of the advantages of having it set to trigger is that you can have the hot cue set to places where you can chop the track up very quickly, knowing that it's gonna continue playing when you hit it, as opposed to having to keep your finger on it. As I say, different DJ gear by default does it in one of those two ways and whichever way you're used to, a bit like having the, you know, the left or right indicator on your car on the left or the right, you know, you're gonna set it to the one you're used to just because that's the way that you do it. But those are there to change that behavior should you want to. Default loop size is the default size when you hit an auto loop, it's currently looping at eight, four, whatever, but uh, the default size when you haven't done anything, you just hit loop, is set here and having that set to four is not a bad thing uh, unless you've got a reason to change it. So smart loops will determine whether or not, when you set a manual loop, so not a loop that's automatically tied to the beats, but a manual loop, whether or not when you do that, it will be automatically put to a length that is standard, like two beats, four beats, eight beats. In other words, if you're setting a manual loop in a track uh, and you go in, out, and it's like three and three quarter beats, it'll turn it into a four beat loop to just tidy your timing up for you. If you want that behavior, you can turn it on in there. If you don't want it, you can turn it off in there. Move Q to loop in. When I press a loop, when I activate a loop on my controller, that will automatically move the temporary Q point to the beginning of that loop. It can be a nice performance feature because you loop something that you want to get back to and then using Q will get you back to that loop at any point in the track. You can have that set on or off when the Q will stay where you set it at the beginning. Some people will prefer to set a Q point for whatever reason and then have it there no matter what they do with the loops. There's your chance to choose that. So we're moving on to display now. So the track title decides whether it gives the metadata for the track title, in other words, the artist and the, and the uh, uh, title and so on, or whether it gives you the file name. You're gonna leave that set to metadata unless you've got a good reason not to. Time format decides whether you speed a track up or slow it down, whether that affects the amount of time it tells you you've got left. Uh, and so you can have that, you know, you speed a track up a bit, it's gonna have a little bit less time uh, to go than if you slow it down, right? So this decides whether it respects that or not. Uh, the track end warning is a good one. It tells you how near the end of a track you've got to be before it starts flashing to tell you you're getting near the end of the track. I don't know how near the end of this track we are, but let's jump forward in it a bit so we get somewhere near the end. There you go, see that's flashing now because I'm near the end of the track. So it's a good way of getting your attention to a track that's nearly run out. On air mode, decides whether there's a difference on what you see on the middle of the dial with the fader down or the fader up. Down, there's gonna be no music coming out of there. That deck's effectively off and there's no lights on it. Up, there's music coming out of there. So turn that off, we don't get that. It's lit all the time. Some people like that because it gives them a warning not to do anything over here because that's playing. And if that's off, it means they can load a track here, do stuff there, whatever. It's gonna be all right. So on to safety. This isn't kind of like saving your life, but it could save your DJ sets. Lock playing deck will stop you being able to load a track onto a deck that's got a track already playing on it. Save my skin many times that has. Needle lock we've talked about. The needle lock on, you need to pause or hold a deck in order to skim through it as I was showing you on the waveform. With that off, you can do it at any time. Pad lock just turns the pads off. Some people don't like the pads. They go, they're off now. This isn't gonna work now. You can't do anything here. Some DJs are not used to it. You don't get pads like that on. CD players that are made by other companies in DJ booths, for instance. So some people just don't want that on. That's a way of turning that off. Now there's a few library settings here as well. We can set how the key is displayed. You'll notice when I was looking at keys, there were a letter and a number, and that's called the Camelot system. Very easy system for DJs to sort their keys out by. But you can, can have it in another version of Camelot called Open Key or two versions of normal key notation. Key filter, this tells us whether we're gonna see tracks in a compatible key or just in the same key when we do the key uh, filtering that I showed you when we were in the search part of this demo. Uh, BPM range will decide the, the, the BPM range you like to play in, uh, pick the one that's nearest to your music, like look in your records and see the lowest BPM and the highest and pick one that kind of like suits because it means that when it analyzes your track, it's likely to do it more successfully and pick the right BPM first time. 
Uh, BPM filter tolerance, again, this is uh, in line with the search stuff we were looking at. When you press BPM, if you remember, I set BPM 120, what tracks have I got around 120? And it gave me ones at 118 and 123. Well, this is where you set it. You set the percentage here of how much tolerance you want there. And finally, last but not least, because this is fun, uh, you can change the deck colors to whatever you want. So this deck color here, I can now change to a digital DJ tips color there, uh, or back to green, whatever, you choose. Uh, and that's where you can uh, alter that. So deck colors can be changed in this area here. You get a nice palette to do that from. So the other two menus are not difficult. We've already looked at source. This lets you choose between the sources that you've got available to you. I've only got one plugged in there at the moment. And the record lets you record your set. I can hit start, start recording my set here. This is being recorded onto the card here. And when I press stop, I can then save it, give it a name and hit save there. And that's now gonna be available to me when I put this card back into a computer and I can drag that off and I've got my set recorded to do what I wish with. And finally, a quick look at how streaming services work. By pressing this button up here, I can select a streaming service. Let's select Beatport Link. As long as you have got a Beatport account and you are logged into that account, it'll ask you to log in if you're not. I've now got all my Beatport tracks here. I've got my Beatport Top 100 here. I can select any genre I want here and in a few seconds it will load the top 100 Afro house tracks from Beatport into here. Here they all are and I can just load these onto decks and DJ with them just like anything else. It's fetching the track now, downloading it from Beatport and I'm now ready to DJ with that track in there. And you have all the stuff that you normally have in Beatport available to you there. So I've got my top 100 tracks, got my latest tracks, curated tracks, my own playlists are in here. This is all available to you inside your subscription in Beatport. And of course, it's not just Beatport, we've got SoundCloud and Tidal at the time of recording this as well. You can't arrange your playlists and stuff at the time of recording this in there, but at the moment, the integration of streaming services is really powerful in here. Although one downside of it is that you can't record your sets as I showed you a second ago, because it disables recording as soon as you go into the streaming services. And there's nothing stopping you having a track playing from your streaming service here and a track playing from your normal DJ collection here. You can mix and match your tunes in that way by switching at the top here using this here to get in and out of either the streaming services or back to the local music that you've got stored on your drives. Now, the Prime 4 is an awesome unit and I've just given you a comprehensive video tutorial on everything it does. But as I said right back at the beginning, that's not the full picture. If you're already a seasoned DJ, you now have everything you need to either decide whether this is for you or to quickly get started with it if you've ordered it or if yours has arrived. But if not, the way we teach DJing in this book, like I said at the beginning, is all about getting you out there quickly and actually doing this and bypassing the trap of thinking you need to sit in your bedroom for months or years to learn this. And we also teach the five big areas of DJing. What I've just taught you lives in the first area, the tech, the gear. Indeed, it's only one part of the technology you need, the technology knowledge you need to DJ. As well as understanding your DJ console, you also need to understand how to plug into a PA, how to gain stage for great sound and countless other geeky things. And there are the other areas as well. There's music. You need to know how to assemble, organize and work a music collection so you've always got the right track to play next. You need to understand the techniques of DJing what to do in order to get the right sound coming out the speakers and to keep your dance floors full. You need to understand how to perform because doing this in public is very different to doing it in your bedroom. And finally, you need to understand how to promote yourself, to get the gigs, how to get yourself out there so people naturally ask you to DJ and not someone else. And it's only when you've got those five things, gear, music, techniques, playing out and promoting yourself, that you can actually start progressing as a DJ. They're not hard to learn, but the big mistake most people make is trying to learn only one of them. Typically, it's the techniques, the mixing, right? I just want to learn to mix, people say. Indeed, a lot of the DJ courses out there are all about mixing. But guess what? If you don't understand the gear, if you're hopeless at finding and organizing the music, if you're too scared to play in front of other people because nobody's taught you through the steps to doing that successfully, look, if you haven't got a clue how to get the gigs in the first place anyway, none of this is actually gonna be that much use to you if you've managed to talk, teach yourself to mix somehow. So we discovered that the fast track to DJing success is to learn those five areas. That's how we teach. 
Now, as I said at the beginning, I want you to have a free copy of our book where I'll help you to get started in all those areas. And you can get that just by joining Digital DJ Tips for free. All the links are underneath. And when you're ready, I'll be thrilled to have you as a student on our complete DJ course where I'll share with you everything you need to know to become a great DJ across all of those five areas. It works for all DJ gear, including this wonderful unit. And again, there's a link underneath for the complete DJ course. So I'll see you in there. Meanwhile, get good, get out there and make the moments.